Moses Anderson. All righty. Thank you, Alan. God is good. God bless you, everybody. Please be seated. Let us be seated. God is good. What a time of worship. I'm glad that I didn't miss that completely. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. We're trying to mitigate, it, uh, mitigate against any kind of cough today. Yeah, isn't that awesome? Praise God. Praise the Lord. God is good. And um, I want you to uh, just turn to somebody and tell them I'm happy for you. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you. Oh, yes. Because um, one of the things that the Lord's been weighing uh, or dealing with me on that's been very strongly impressed upon my heart of late is that many of us are waiting for someone or something to tell us that we are growing and that we are not where we were. You know, as children, you're looking forward to that 18th birthday party. So that once you turn 18, then you can do a lot of the stuff that you couldn't do before, which is interesting because a lot of what people want to do are not the good stuff. You know, because a lot of the good things that you need to do in life, you should be able to do at all times because the Bible says to do good always. You know, but we usually have a set time or an age, and I want to encourage you that today you will hear God prophetically because quite often the message comes forth prophetically, but you may not receive it prophetically. You know, the Bible says deep calls unto deep. You know, someone could be prophesying over you whilst you are busy receiving it as a word of advice. Someone could be declaring prophetically over you a word to enlarge your heart and to see faith grow, but you may not receive it as it is being handed out. You may take it for a word of encouragement. You may take it for uh, a fundraiser. You may take it for all kinds of things. But the Bible says that we need to receive that implanted word of God with meekness because it is able to save our souls, allowing it to mix with faith in our hearts. And so today the word is coming forth and it is coming forth by the unction of the Holy Spirit prophetically, and I pray that you will be able to receive it also prophetically, that as you are receiving the scrolls of instruction today, that your eyes of understanding will be open, that you may know exactly where to place that scroll and exactly what to do with it, that you may understand what it is saying for you to act upon the things that it is calling for you to measure up to in the mighty name of Jesus. I know that I say that specifically today for the benefits of some people who, as I stand here, have been saying in their hearts, and the Lord would let me have the privilege of seeing the desire for the word. And as soon as I saw about two or three people saying, oh, am I getting a word today? I need a word. I need a prophetic word. What was said to me by the angel of the Lord is that the word is sure, but will they receive it as it comes? And so I pray for you today that you will be that person who allows that word of God to be the seed of the sower that finds the good soil of your heart to rest upon. Simply because you know as well as I do that you can use a 30-fold return and maybe you can even use a 60-fold return. I hear Alan in the back and he's saying, Father, I want the 100-fold return. You know, but in order for us to enjoy any one of those possibilities, we must be willing to receive that word of God with meekness. You know, I have said it here before when I say it again, that the word of God is an implanted word. The word implanted is the word engrafted. That means that which is coming from God may not necessarily be that which you are bringing to God. You see, a farmer would go ahead to graft a tangerine that is known to be very fruitful, a, a tangerine tree that is known to be very fruitful in a particular climate, and they will graft it onto an orange tree that is struggling to survive in the same climate. And the reason why the farmer would do that is because the farmer has identified a power that is higher than the factors around. The farmer has identified a power that is above the elements that are against. And so because this tangerine, uh, do people use the word tangerine here? Oh yeah. So this tangerine, 
Oh, yeah, because sometimes I'll be speaking in tongues and folks just be smiling in tongues. But I tell you, yeah, I need to make sure that we are on the same page today. Because uh, sometime last week, I, I, I had a conversation with the Lord and he did say to me that even though you and I are of the same book, sometimes we're not on the same page. It hit me so hard. He says, because the same book, which is the volume of the books, wherein it was written concerning me, that I would take the sin of the world, that I, who knew no sin, would be made sin, that I would have to go through the denial, the betrayal of friends, the denial of the world, and ultimately, the gruesome death of the cross. He said, it was written of me in the volume of the books, just as your days have been written by your heavenly Father. He says, but there are times wherein you and I are not on the same page. You know, it's not one of those things that you hear and then you're like, oh, thank you, Jesus. That was awesome. That was just like, yeah, whatever. You know, but the reality of it was, you know, sometimes you say whatever because you really want to go and think about it and tell yourself off. And so I decided to, to, do, to reflect on certain things. And I was asking myself this question on, concerning this business. Am I on the same page with the Lord Jesus? Am I on the same page with the word of God? So today I want us all to be on the same page. So when I say a word that you may not have heard before, uh, feel free to, to not smile too much so that I know that you're trying to process it. So a farmer will take a tangerine that is already known to be able to overpower whatever may be against in that environment and bring it and then implant we are familiar with the word implants, you know, because there are some people who knew them when they just finished college. And then after a while, you see them and all things may have been suppressed while all things have now been enlarged. And so when people receive implants, they do so so as to be able to receive certain abilities or features that they did not previously have. But I tell you one thing that is a guarantee with implants that are made by men. The Bible says the arm of flesh shall fail. Those implants are never like the one that was done by the creator. It is never the same. You know why? Because whatsoever it is that the Lord does stands forever. But there, there is no shame. We've all had implants. Uh, you know, I may have one in my, tooth, in my teeth. Just so that you feel better about yourself if yours is elsewhere. I don't want you to feel alone. You know, because you know how it is, you know, people from the pulpit be speaking like saints and then you're sitting there just thinking every word is there to judge you. I want to encourage you, don't worry, that which you desire from men that they deliver half-hazardly, the Lord can give to you so generously. So trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. And we're going back to the word implant. So you see what I said to you about the reason why you need to listen prophetically because I may speak like that often today, wherein... I'm speaking, but I'm not looking up, and in between, I am saying certain things that you need to hear. So today, we want to look at what it means to receive the implanted Word of God, because that Word of God is meant to enhance you, to give you abilities that you previously may not have had. James 1.21. I want us to analyze those, I think there are about just two or three statements in here. It says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness." and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. The Bible says, let's lay aside every filthiness. Let's lay aside the overflow of wickedness. There was a time that you were a wicked person because the opposite of godly is wicked. So when you are not being godly, and how did I define godliness to you uh, on Tuesday? I defined godliness to you as a conscious and intentional, pragmatic approach to seeing yourself emulate and reflect the character of God, which means holiness. So your dedication to living a holy life is the true meaning of godliness. And so before you became that person who decided to embark on the journey of allowing Christ to be seen in you, the hope of glory, all your focus was, was to see, to have the world seen in you. You want to measure up by the standard of the world. And that is what wickedness is. Wickedness is when you are totally living opposite to what God intends for you. So we all were born into sin. We all were born 
And by default, we came to the scene in the image of the fallen Adam. Every single one of us. And that is the reason why we need the grace of the second and the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, that we might be new creations in him. Praise the Lord. And so when we arrived, we all arrived broken. We were all dead on arrival. And we needed help. And then we found the Lord Jesus Christ. We came to appreciate the gospel and to receive that promise of eternal life, beginning with the righteousness, peace, and joy that has already been delivered in this realm. You see, eternal life is not for you to wait for when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. There are portions or there are aspects of your eternal life that is already available now. The Bible says the kingdom of God has come to be with men and it is serviceable in their mouth. And what is that kingdom? Righteousness, peace, and joy. You see, because some people say, but I know somebody down the street who claimed to have been born again. They got born again in the spring of 1954 and they lived up until 2022. But at the end of the day, you wouldn't call that eternal life, would you? It was a good long life, but it was not eternal. I tell you what, eternal life is already here in the form of righteousness, peace, and joy. And it is there for you to experience so that you have a, you have a grip on the hope of that which is to come, which is a new body that would allow for you to enjoy that eternal life. And so that kingdom of God is here. You have received it. You are born again. You are told that once you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, you then become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And I believe that is the story of many of us that are present in here. And if that is not yet your story, please make sure you come and see me after the service so that we can talk a little bit about what you may be missing. But the reality of it is at some point we have come to acknowledge the grace that came to rescue us from darkness by translation into light. To take us from being rejected by adoption into God's own family. However, there is something that still follows us every now and again. And it is called the overflow of wickedness. Sometimes that whole life that Jesus delivered you from finds its way into your life. Because the reality of it is that life itself abhors a vacuum. God designed this world such that you cannot really have a vacuum. Something has to fill up the space. Remember the, 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 the wisdom that Jesus dropped when he said, when a man is delivered of evil spirits, even if it is just one evil spirit, and he is not filled with another. When that spirit, that demon that was driven out, comes back again. You know, the reason why demons hold on to people is that it is not as easy as you might think to possess a human being. And so, when this demon finally finds somebody, and they're enjoying that person because they've been able to condition the person's way of thinking to accommodate all of the requests of the demon. You know, every time that demon wants to be high, it tells you to go and smoke something and you oblige. So that demon has already trained you and schooled you to do its bidding. So whenever a demon is cast out of a person, the very first candidate of choice for that demon to return to is that same person because he knows about this thing called the overflow of wickedness. Because if he can come again, he can easily open up the files that were closed. Someone says, I thought those files were deleted. No, it was the handwriting of the ordinances against you that got deleted. Not the ones that you wrote yourself. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? The, the Bible says the handwriting of the ordinances that are against you have been blotted out so that you can start afresh. But then having started afresh, if you decide to keep writing malice and unforgiveness and you write indulgence and you write excessive pleasure seeking, you are doing that by yourself and you are within your rights too because you are a creation of will. And so when those files get closed and that demon comes, he comes looking for easy access. And Jesus tells us that when he comes and he finds that you have not been filled, so you got delivered of an evil spirit. 
but you have not yet filled yourself with the Holy Spirit. Just as the Bible says, the Bible says you need to constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, you know that things that use air or wind usually require being refilled. Your tire is an example. Your lungs are a very great example. You can't just breathe before leaving home and say, you know what, I don't even know what, if anyone has flu at church, I don't want to take the risk. In fact, last week the pastor was coughing his mind out almost. So I'm just going to breathe at home and not breathe again until I come back home. Can you do that? Can you just take a breath outside and say, well, I don't like it inside that auditorium. It doesn't smell nice. I'm not going to breathe until the service is over. You can't even try that here because sometimes the service is never over. Everything that requires to be filled with air needs to be constantly filled with air. And that's why the Bible says, the Bible did not just say be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says be being filled with the Holy Spirit. That means at all times, be in the process of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because you don't drink wine to get drunk on the 1st of April and then expect to still be drunk on the 7th of July. If you find that kind of wine, we're rich. <laughs> Let me know about it. Just imagine, just sell a glass of wine and then the person is going to be drunk forever. You see, because the Bible compares being filled with the Holy Spirit to being drunk with wine, that is why it is said, do not be drunk with wine wherein there is dissipation, but be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the way you drink wine and after a while it clears from your face, when you see the blue light suddenly, it clears. Don't try that at home because that's not how it works. But your mind, in your mind, it clears. But then after a while, you need to be drunk again. That is how being filled with the Spirit is. You need to constantly be filled. So Jesus says, if an evil spirit has been driven out of a man and the man refuses to be filled with the right spirit, with the Holy Spirit, and the demon returns, the demon will see that the place is swept and garnished, and I mean swept and clean, and it will go and find seven mightier demons than itself. It will say to them, guys, we cannot be kicked out again because this one is easy. Every time I tell her to get up in the middle of the night to go drink some, she does. Every time someone offends her and I tell her you cannot forgive, she holds a grudge. Where else can you find somebody that obedient? And the other demons will say, it's hard these days. So we might as well just come with you and all of us we will be camping in that fellow. Let me now say this. The reason why there is an overflow of wickedness is exactly what Jesus just described to us. When we give our lives to Christ and we become newborn babes in Christ, as we grow, we need to be filled with more things. Because many of us will receive that measure of the Holy Spirit, which is a guarantee for everyone who comes to be named by the name of Christ. We receive that measure of the Holy Spirit, which is intended to nurture you and to cause your vessel to grow. But the moment your vessel grows, you need more infilling. You need more infilling because you need to fill up that vessel. And that is the reason why when people give their lives to Christ, can we do some Christianity 101 here? When people give their lives to Christ, the first couple of weeks, they're on cloud nine. They're over the moon. Everything they ask God, even before they ask God, they're like, God, did you know I was about to ask you? Stop it, God. You just did it. Everything is fun and nice and dandy. And then, you know, when they're, when they're speaking in tongues, even though their tongues is like, ah, there's only two syllables. Oshkuba, Oshkuba, Oshkuba. But they get so fired up, they're excited about that little two tongues that they're speaking. Two syllables. Because the vessel is still very small. But then as you grow, you need more than those two syllables. You need your senses sharpened, like the apostle said, by reason of use. And then three, four months down the line, the vessel has grown, but the infilling has remained the same. And they begin to question if they made the right decision. After six months, they call some of those friends that they had stopped talking to. They're like, where are you guys hanging out tonight? They're like, okay, you miss us? No, not like I miss you, but I just want to come out, you know, just get some air. You see what I did there? Yeah, get some air. 
the air that is in that place cannot be of God. The Bible says, why seek the living among the dead? The kind of air that you need is that which is produced only by the wind of heaven. The wind of the Holy Spirit. But then you go to the bar to catch, to get some air. And then as soon as you walk in, it's downhill from there. What we need to do to avoid the overflow of wickedness is to recognize that the overflow of wickedness is a natural phenomenon when it comes to spiritual things. And what I mean by natural when it comes to spiritual is that when you're talking about the dimension of the spirit, that overflow is a given. It happens all the time. It is now your responsibility to ensure that there is no room for wickedness to fail. Because when you are already filled with the Holy Spirit and there is an overflow of wickedness, what does it do? It keeps moving because there is no room in the end. So going back to this James chapter 1 verse 21, the Bible lets us know that there is definitely going to be an overflow of wickedness. But you need to lay it aside and receive with meekness the implanted word of God. That is really where I want to zone in for now. To receive with meekness the implanted word of God. Why is it required for you to receive it with meekness? Because the word of God, when it comes to you, it doesn't come to you like you come to it. Simple example is you come to the word of God as a sinner. But the word of God comes to you as a savior. You come to the word of God as one who is begging for the miserable elements of this world. I want you to give me this. I want you to give me that. But he comes to you with godliness and godliness is laced with contentment. So you come greedy, but you leave content. And that is because the one that you meet with is not coming from where you are coming from. And this is where mostly we struggle. Because a lot of our own ideas, a lot of the things that we want to do, are very different from what the Word of God is telling us to do. Many of us are so accustomed to the way of getting things done. The way I get my wife to do what she wants is to be mean and is to start throwing tantrums because then she will know that I am mad and she will not do that again. But that is not the way God comes to you. The Bible says that we are constrained by the love of God in the ministry of the Holy Spirit unto every good work. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, unto every good work. Because it is that love of God that is shed abroad our hearts that constrains us unto every good work. The good works that the Lord does through us and in us are a function of the love that he has for us, not by his heavy handedness. God doesn't come pounding you into the ground so that you can do the good stuff. But by default, because of the Adamic nature that is within us, we are more likely to subscribe to the filth and the wickedness before we subscribe to the purity and the holiness. And that is the reason why we need to know that to receive the word of God, it has to be with meekness. It has to be with a posture of meekness to say, you know what? I'm not even going to think about what I would have done. I'm just going to clear my mind and receive what God's word is telling me to do. Do you know that there are times wherein you receive letters in the mail and once you read that letter because of the consequences that are promised to you by another party or organization, your feet begin to shake. Your knees start to knock at each other. That is the natural man. That is the overflow of wickedness. That is an overflow of the fallen nature. But now that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are not meant to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so when you receive a letter or you receive news from someplace that is not pleasant, you must always remember that the word of God says, be anxious for nothing. But you know how that word of God is actually going to benefit you? When you receive it with meekness. And what is meekness? What does it look like in certain situations? So you receive a letter in the mail saying that if you do not pay this bill by so so time, we're coming to take that property from you. We're coming to take that car from you. Whatever it is they want to take from you. Meekness is this. To first of all, tell yourself like Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You see, to be meek is to be ready to be without. 
To be meek is to be ready to let go of everything. You see, because sometimes we're not ready to let go and we want the word of God to work for us. So we're forcing the word of God to give us peace when we're still holding on to all of our possessions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that on this side. Maybe, maybe I'll have a witness here. You see, we want the word of God to work the way we choose. You're saying to yourself, if God is really God and he can do all things, you should settle this bill once and for all. But is that meekness? Or are you Aladdin commanding the genie to do your wishes? God is not a genie in a lamp. <laughs> he is the almighty. He is called the Lord of all spirits. He is the author and the finisher. He is called the beginning and the end of all things. We do not manipulate him unless we are telling him to do what his word already says because he says, by the word of my mouth, command me. Not by the words of your mouth. Who are we to command the most high God? But that is what we do. The word of God can only benefit us when we receive it with meekness, when we are ready to be lowly, when we are ready to not let anything that is being held over us weigh more in our hearts than the love of our heavenly father. If the loss of anything makes you sorrowful, then that means that thing has more weight in your life than the love of your heavenly father because you may lose all things, but you can never lose the Habas love. Imagine if you have 10,000 soldiers that are standing next to you and they say to you that we're not going anywhere, we are with you in life and in death. And then somebody comes from the back of the line, the guy that can barely hold his sword, and he says, uh, actually, I just reviewed the contract. I don't think I want to be in your army anymore. I'll see you later. Are you going to be sorrowful that that little fellow who cannot hold his sword properly who, is, who cares more about what he will personally get than the victory that you all will win? Will you be afraid and nervous that that one is leaving you? No, because you have more of a weight. You have a weightier army behind you than the scrungy fellow. So what do you do? You say to him like Jesus said to the people that he invited to join the army, but then not one reason or the other. You know, Jesus didn't beg anybody to follow him. He would ask them, he says, follow me. And if they don't, he says, well, shame on you. Let the dead bury the dead. And so you say to that fellow and tell him, go and take that contract with you. And don't come back. Because Jesus says, whoever lays his hands on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom. Because you already signed up for the army, but now you're talking about your personal pleasures. And because the contract is not pleasurable enough to you, you want to chicken out? Readance. Because quite often, we forget that Jesus is the captain of our salvation, which means he is the captain of this army. But then again, the world has done everything possible to convince us that we're not an army. Because if we are an army, then we will not worry about certain things that we worry about. For the word of God says, who is that one that is a, that is a soldier that encumbers himself with the cares of this life? Who, are you a real soldier if you are so weighted down or weighed down by the cares of this life? Your focus is meant to be on doing your part in bringing victory home. And once everything is yours, including the sea, then everything is yours. <laughs> but in any case, to receive the word of God with meekness is to be ready to not let anything appeal to your ego. You need to be able to resign yourself. You know, there are two reasons why. Okay, now I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to get there. I want to talk to you about meditation and prayer. But on this subject of what the word of God will do for you, you need to be able to humble yourself and recognize that it is by following that word of God that you will be saved not by the word of God following you. You know, because sometimes you have already made up your mind and say, God, I am going to Sneville. Are you coming or not? Because that's what we do. 
Remember, David would go to God and say, should I overtake them or not? Should I just stay here? Should I pursue them? And then the Lord would say, pursue and you will overtake. And sometimes the Lord would say, stay here. But many of us were always willing to pursue. And then we're asking God to come along and God is like, that's not what I want to do. And I am not like you. I do my will. I don't do the will of the pleasures of the flesh. You understand what I mean? So again, are you on the same page as God or not? So for that implanted word of God, that engrafted word of God, to be able to save you and to be able to do you good, you need to be able to submit to it. I want to show you a verse of scripture in the book of John, chapter 16, verse 33. I still want to explain this further, but I want to give you an incentive. Because if we don't have an incentive, sometimes as human beings, we do not take the high road. If we don't have an incentive, we're never willing or hardly are we willing to make sacrifices. We don't want to be meek if there is no incentive. And for those of you who may not have heard me explain the meaning of the word meek, the word meek was the word that was used to describe horses that were born in the wild, that were then broken, retrained, and domesticated. So the origin of the word meek describes a wild horse. And why, was, why, why would people do that? Why would they go through the trouble of finding a wild horse and, and breaking that horse? They break the spirit of the horse. They break the horse and make it a domestic animal that is tamed when they could have just taken the horse that was born in the stable 12 yards away from their bedroom. For those who, who may not have done the study or heard me speak about it, the reason why the ancient looked for horses to make meek, in fact, I think that word meek actually literally means a horse that has gone through the process, not just the process itself. So the reason why they would do that is because of the fact that horses that are born in the place of comfort always run away from battle. Horses that are born in stables, that are raised in comfort, whenever they see battle, they recognize battle. And they will turn around and cast off whoever is riding them and say to the man that is trying to force them into the face of the fire, not today, Satan. I am going back to pleasure. They don't, they don't, want, they don't want the smoke. They don't want the sword. They don't want to be pierced. No, they don't. And that was the reason why the men of old will go through so much trouble to capture wild horses because a horse that is born in the wild will always face battle without fear of death. You're welcome. Because that explains why we had to be born in the lowest realm of existence. We were born here because this is the jungle of the seven realms. This is a place wherein you can only be in one place at, at one time, at any given time. I mean, your minds can wander because your mind is not just in this realm. Your mind can be in the third realm, in the fourth realm, in the fifth realm, depending on how deep you are in the things of God and your understanding of how things work because there are people who are not even particularly godly, but they understand the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, I'm trying to use the right word here so that uh, we don't misconstru misconstrue. They understand the transformation that is required to experience translation, okay? So I, yes, I'm glad that I found that word because I've been wanting to teach on that. You know, I spoke about dimensions a while ago. See, this is a word for somebody else, so you better pay attention. You know, when I was talking about dimensions, I talked about the fact that you're required to be a multidimensional being. But in order for you to be able to access the dimensions, so basically being able to access dimensions is called translation. You can be translated from one realm to another realm, one realm into another realm. And the reason why the word translation is preferred is because you exist as a code in each of the realms that you are in. You are coded into this realm. And so for you to be able to run this program that looks like this 
in the next realm, you need to be translated into the language of the next realm. So think about it as different software programs that run at the same time. So if you exist in the physical realm, you are coded with another kind of language, which is called dirt. But if you want to excel in the realm of imagination, you have to access another language, which is called the language of what? Thoughts. You need to be able to use your thoughts. And so you, for you to be translated, there's one requirement mostly. And what is that requirement? You have to be transformed. Well, I just got here, so we might as well get into it. Romans chapter 12. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> the Bible says, Romans chapter 12, I'm being considerate, of course, but I'm just saying. Romans chapter 12, what did Paul say? And that was what we were talking about on Tuesday. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying, don't, just, don't be stuck here. Don't be conformed to this world and this world alone. Many people live only in this realm. They sleep, they wake up, they are dirt. They are human beings. They care only about themselves. It's all about the animal. The animal is a deadly place to be all the time. Because when you are an animal all the time, you're just seeking for food, for pleasure, for survival, and it doesn't matter who has to die for you to live. But we need to do more than that because we are not just animals. We just have an animal body. We are spirit beings. We are made in the image and in the likeness of the creator of all the realms and beyond. And so when Paul says do not be conformed but be transformed, it's because he knows that if you are not transformed, you cannot be translated. Anyway, where was I going with that? What was I talking about, Shayla? Okay, that's a good answer, but I want to go back to where I was before that time. John 16, 33. So I was talking about the fact that sometimes we need an incentive to be able to go the extra mile and take the high road and do what we're supposed to do. So this is the incentive that I want to give us, and then I'll go back to explaining what I was saying. You see, the Bible says, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace in the world. You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the world, you can have things, but you cannot have peace. Peace is only guaranteed in the Lord Jesus. Now, Jesus says, many will come in my name. It is part of the great deception. Satan has managed to convince many people that they can be at peace and that, in fact, they should be at peace in this realm without the Lord Jesus. It is what John was talking about in Revelations, and he calls it what? False peace. It is not real peace. So, the real peace that you and I experience is the peace that we experience in Christ Jesus. Because in the world, what we are guaranteed is tribulation. And the reason why that is, is because the realm that we are born into, in reality, is a tribulation realm. We are born on earth. Come on. It doesn't get any harder than this. And someone says, what about Hades? It's the basement of the earth. That's why it's called Hades. It's called Sheol, which means inside of the ground. Sheol literally means the belly of the ground. Okay? So, it's the belly of the ground. And from all indications, Jesus shut it down. Because the Bible says, having spoiled all principalities and powers, and made an open show of them. And he set the captives free. And he left captivity itself captive. So, when he went to Sheol, he shut it down. That is the reason why the souls who are not in compliance with salvation who do not believe the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible did not say that they will be taken to Sheol or to Hades. The Bible says they will be tossed into the lake of fire where they are destroyed. After Jesus was raised from the dead, there was no more mention to Hades. As, as, an, as, as an operation, it's the physical location still exists, but as an operation, 
it no longer exists because Jesus shut down that operation. Which means we are kind of like the new bottom of the bottom. This earth. And that's why he says in this world, what you will get is tribulations and trials. Because of the fact that we need to go through all of that tribulation so that we are toughened and also meek. Because there is a final battle. You know, there's been several iterations of evil and good, of darkness and light. Multiple generations, multiple iterations. If you read Psalms 104, you will understand there's been multiple civilizations that have been given an opportunity to choose light over darkness, to engage in the battle of light over darkness. But one thing that we do know is that Jesus promised that after 1,000 years of the millennial reign, the deceiver will be released to deceive again for another 1,000 years. And after that 1,000 years of deception, which is what we are currently in, the age of deception, he says there will be peace forever. So this is the final, 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 final. When they say the final battle, this is it. But God is not going to march people to the battlefront who have only known pleasure all their lives because when they see that battle, they will turn and they will run. And that is the reason why God chose to raise his army in the hardest of places. Look at you right now. Now imagine how much better you will be when all the restrictions of this realm are no longer holding you down. <laughs> you know, in the, in, the, in the very simple sense of it, it's like asking someone to jump with weights every day. They have weights tied to them. In fact, let's not even talk about gym because I don't want to give anyone anxiety. Let's talk about when you go swimming and you've been in water and the water has been carrying most of your weight because it's very dense and you swim in the water straight for like an hour. What happens to you when you come out? Your body feels heavier. And he's like, what happened? Yeah, it's because you are no longer used to carrying your own weight. And that is how we train people to be strong. We put weights on them ahead of the battle ahead of the tournament, ahead of the competition. And when the competition day comes, we strip the weight off of them. And then that body now becomes almost non-existent because they have carried something heavier and their muscles are trained to do more. And so now that they're not carrying more weight, what do they turn it into? Ah, oh, you weren't listening. Oh, you were not listening. They turn it into speed because the moment you have been transformed, you automatically get translated. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> excuse, excuse me. Because in physics, we call motion that is forward, we call it what? Translational motion. That means you're, you're getting translated. Anyway, let's not get into it. But the reality of it is that once you're transformed, you become translated. Once you've learned how to carry weight and the weight is no longer there, you shoot very far simply because you have built what it takes. So I'm saying many things in one, but where I'm going with this ultimately is that I want you to recognize the need for you to be a meek horse. To be able to receive the word of God with meekness. To recognize that you can be stubborn, you can be strong-headed, you can have your own plans, you can be intelligent, you can know how to do things, but then bring all of those things to subjection and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. You are not a gentleman if you're a weakling. You're a gentleman if you're strong, but you still know how to hold your peace. If someone says to you, oh, I'm gentle, but you look at them and it's like, okay, even if you're not gentle, what can you do? Look at you. You can't even kill a mosquito. So you're not gentle, you're just weak. But if I'm a strong man and I'm capable of war, but then I choose to just keep my cool, then you call me a gentleman. Because I chose not to be as strong as I am. Not to demonstrate, demonstrate my strength. And so what it means to be a meek one is to have all of that wildness within you. You were born in the wild. 
also known as the earth. All of that ruthlessness is in you. You know how to cut somebody else down. You know how to get ahead if you need to. You know how to do all of those things, but you decided to submit all of that at Calvary so that you are not moving in your own ability and in your own might, so that you are able to let the word of God have its full course in you. If we can understand what it means to lay it all down, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, then the word of God will begin to work for you like never before. The reason why it hasn't worked as much as you want it, as readily as you want it, is because you are trying to make that word of God do what you want, as opposed to telling yourself that you have come to do what the word says. There is a big difference. As closely as they might seem to us every now and again, and guess what? It's time for the word to work for you. That's your incentive. Jesus says in the world, you have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I used to wonder, what has your overcoming the world have to do with me? Because I wish he had said, be of good cheer. You have overcome. It's like you're broke. You don't have $10 in your bank account. And Chris comes to you and says, James, I know you don't have any money right now, but it's okay because I have money. And it's like, okay. So I, I missed the part where your money is my money. Because if I don't have money and you have money, I missed the part wherein you have said that now your money is my money. Jesus said here that you will have tribulations and trials, not him. You, it's your problem. He's not here. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. You understand what I mean? Jesus is far above principalities and powers. He has already run his race. He has paid his dues. The Father said to him, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. But you see the ones that I'm leaving behind? And Jesus even prayed to the Father in the next chapter. He said to the Father, he says, I don't want you to take them out of the world just yet. I'm like, Jesus, come on. You could have just said, take them now. He says, don't take them out of the world. He says, but keep them in the world. I'm like, wow, and you say you love me. Have you seen the world lately and you still want me to be here? He says, but keep them in the world. You see, Jesus says, you will have tribulations and trials. I have overcome. This is the reason why you need to let the word of God that became flesh. Who is the one speaking right here? The Lord Jesus. You need to allow for him to be implanted into you so that you can grow in his victory. You see, when we're talking about receiving the implanted word of God with meekness, it is the only way by which you can access that peace even though you are planted in tribulation. It is the only way by which you can have joy even though sorrow seems to not want to depart from your gate. It is the only way by which you can walk in love even though you have been disappointed, you have been disgusted, and you have been denied. It is the only way because everything that you are struggling with in the climate that surrounds the soil of your planting, the tangerine is able to overcome. The Lord Jesus says, I have already overcome it. So if you allow me to be engrafted into you, I bring all the prowess, all the ability to make you do what I did. We will struggle if we do not know how to submit to the word of God. How to just believe what the word of God says. If the word of God says, I am above always and not beneath, it doesn't matter what I see when I look up. I shouldn't even be looking in the first place because I walk not by sight, but by faith. It doesn't matter. I am only subscribed to the word of God. I only believe what it says. I feel what it suggests. And I go after the things that it recommends. If I can live my life like that, I will be at peace even though I am rooted in tribulation. The mystery of meekness. Now, I'm going to tell you two things about your mouth. You know, the kingdom of God that has come is accessible, serviceable through your mouth, right? First of all, many of us, we are literally too full of ourselves. And you need 
to weaken your flesh. I'm going to say that again very slowly because it's the area where most of us struggle. You know, we struggle because we have already taken a particular posture in life. You know when people tell you, that's me, that's what I do, that's how I like my things, they're not talking about their flesh, but they're talking about their bones. Because you know we're flesh and bones. Adam said to Eve, you are flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. Your flesh refers to the things that you believe you must have to enjoy comfort. The soft side of you is your flesh. But the strong side of you in the natural is your bone. So when people like to go and drink and get drunk, that is their flesh. It's one of the works of the flesh because it's something that makes them feel a little comfort for a little while. You understand what I mean? If somebody tells a little lie every now and again, just so that people can think of them in another light, people can think that they have more money than they have, or people can think that they're nicer than they really are, you know you don't like to help anybody move. And so when they tell you they're moving, you're like, oh my gosh, did you say next Saturday? Oh, goodness. That, that day I'm going to be in Timbuktu. I've, I totally forgot. You could have simply said, I'm in town, but I don't like to move, and I ain't helping you, so that they know you're not nice. But you want to look nice, so what do you do? You tell a little lie. What is that? Your flesh. Because it makes you feel good, that people think you're good. So a lot of those things are the flesh. But the bone part of the human being are those things that you have called non-negotiables. This is me. I don't, I don't do that. All of you, I don't do that. I am a man of principle. I don't do this. Unless you are saying that because the word of God says that's what you should do. But if you take a posture because it is your principle, then you are a man. Do you know that there was a time that God told me to go and beg somebody for help? And I'm like, uh -uh, but God, that guy, I, was, I, I mentored him in, what, in that thing that he's doing. And the Lord said to me, yes, I need you to go and say, please help me. This was how I said it. Can you please help me? I didn't want to dwell on it because I, I, that, for me, you don't do that. That was my principle. So that wasn't my flesh as much as it was my bone. I had taken that posture that I do not bend over to receive from somebody that I have given to because I feel like that's me saying, oh, I helped you 10 years ago, so it's time for you to help me. So I took that posture. I'm, I'm not going to ask. And so this is the thing that goes around with many of us. We have such a bony structure that does not allow for the word of God to take its rightful place in us. It doesn't, we don't allow the word of God to get us to that point where we are flexible to move according to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Simply because we have already taken a posture that that is me. If somebody hangs up the phone on me, I block their number. That's what I do. Yeah, that's what I do. Because, I mean, for you to hang up, that means you don't think too much of me, you know. And then you start to justify all of the reasons why it is such a taboo to hang up on you. Who is man that you are mindful of him? The Bible says, let no one of you think of himself more highly than he ought to. You've heard my story. When I was in high school, I thought I was all that and a bag of chips. And so there were certain people that I just started to cut off because I thought their foolishness was too much. And one day, one of my friends, he called me, and he was like, hey, um, Moses, can you please tell me this guy's number? I'm like, the same guy that I just fell out with, that I'm not talking to anymore, you are not asking me for his number. I said to the boy, I said, how dare you? This is beneath me. He was like, oh, I'm sorry. And then he's like, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I said, don't do that again. Never in your life do that again. And then I hung up the phone. I looked at the phone like I should smash it. How disgusting. And I was reciting to myself, this dude knows fully well that myself and that guy were not speaking on speaking terms anymore. He did this to me. He did that to me. I was saying all of those things. I was foaming in the mouth. And guess what? He stopped calling me. And he probably told other people about my response. And they stopped calling me too. So after a couple of weeks, I realized that no one was calling me. Two months, I was no longer feeling as important. Three months, 
I had lost that ego. Whatever was left of it was now not as desirable as it was. I was at home begging that someone would at least call me. You see, the lesson that I learned from that is that of all the people he could have called who knew that guy's number, he chose to call me because I was on his mind. He chose to call me because he would rather talk to me than somebody else. And I rubbished him, and from that day onwards, my wife is always, I wish my wife was here. She's teaching the youth today. I wish she was here because sometimes she says to me, why are you always like this? Oh, somebody texted me. Somebody called me. And I will always try to tell my wife because what is more important than another person? God says you claim to love me when you do not love man that you can see. But you keep saying you have love for a God that you do not even see. You know, many of us, we don't even know how to make time for people. We don't know how to make ourselves available because we are too important. It's one thing to be busy, but when you are busy and you're not able to be available, let it be known that you are making the effort as opposed to, they should know that I am important, I am busy, get in line. Keep saying that. One day you may not have a line behind you. And that's when you would realize that, oh, I wish, I wish that person that used to annoy me would even come and annoy me right now. You see, all that bony structure needs to go. I'm going to share with you a secret real quick of how to break your own bones. David said, in silence, my bones were weakened within me. In silence, my bones were weakened within me. You know, we always quote that scripture when we're trying to encourage people to not just be silent in the face of opposition, in the face of trials, in the face of difficulty. We will say something, oh, say something. The Bible says if you believe and with your heart and confess with your mouth, you need to speak. David said, I believe, therefore I speak. We quote such scriptures. But the Holy Spirit said to me that the principle works anyway. If you keep silent when you should speak, you'll be weak. But if you're also strong in the areas wherein you should actually be weak before the Lord, you can also use the same silence to weaken your bony structure. Many of us will need to go before the Lord in silence and just be quiet and just be still before him. God's salvation is standing next to you, but you do not see him because you are still too full of yourself. You are standing taller than the glory that God has for you. The Bible says you need to decrease. You need to decrease so that he might increase. Many of us, we need to go before the Lord and be silent and let him reveal to you the things of your bony structure, the things of your pride. The Bible says that there are three things that cause men to go astray. The pride of life, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the flesh. Everything else that I was talking about is the lust of the flesh. Wanting to do this, wanting to do that. But there is also something called the pride of life, which is that bony, that bone within you that wants to just take a posture and not give it up. This is what I do and I'm not going to change. If I've left the place, I don't go back there. If I've done this, I don't do that. No, just go before the Lord and be silent and then begin to reflect in your thoughts those things that you have said boastfully and retire them at the foot of the Lord. I had to do that. We all need to do that. Paul did that. And so must we at every opportunity we get to allow that silence. You know what that silence does? Is when you come to a place and you want to lay yourself down, you don't speak. Because the more you speak, the more you have the tendency of wanting to promote yourself and wanting to maintain your position. When Jesus came before Pontius Pilate, when Jesus came before Caiaphas the high priest, what was he accused of? He was accused of being silent when they were levying accusations against him. 
And you know why? Because every time he spoke, he only reaffirmed who he was. But he already told his disciples, he says, my life is in my hands and I lay it down. And the way to lay it down, the way to allow his bones to be softened is for him not to speak. Because if he had spoken, there was no way they would have been able to nail him to the cross. So I say to you today, if Jesus says in me, you have peace. The way to be in him is to allow yourself to become meek. And the way to become meek is to go silent on the things of your boasting and repent of them in your heart before the Lord. One more thing that I'm going to tell us and then we're going to break bread is this. I've been asking the Lord, I said, Lord, I want something that we can practice in this next season at Communion House that will result in the very measurable growth in our walk with you. I said, Lord, I want to see us more mature than we were a year ago. In the coming year, I want to see a new kind of maturity in the people that you have assigned to this work and that you have assigned this work unto. And this is what the Holy Spirit brought to me. He said to me, when you were a child, you spoke as a child. When you were a child, you thought as a child. And when you were a child, you understood as a child. He says, but now put away childish things. Let's have James 1, 21 on the screen again. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought as a child. And I understood as a child. He says, but now I put away childish things. James 1.21 says, therefore lay aside every filthy, filthiness. When you're a child, you're messy. When you're a child, you make filth. Thank you, Cody, I appreciate that. All the time. And without even knowing it. Many of us are babes when it comes to the things of the kingdom. And we have remained children for far too long. A six-month-old baby that poops on his or herself is okay because that's what they're supposed to do. They're but infants. But when they're seven, eight years old and they're still doing that, then you are concerned. Because you're like, ah, uh, something isn't right. We need to take this more seriously. And God forbid that they're still doing that when they're 12 years old. You know why? Because now they're supposed to have come of age no longer being in filth. Overcoming every wickedness. And the overflow of wickedness. Do you know that there are times wherein you will find a toddler doing certain things that infants do? They can still put their foot in their mouth. Because it's an overflow of where they're coming from. Because they're not yet that far away from it. We need to put a gap between who we are now and who we used to be. We need to be intentional about making sure that my light has come. I can no longer walk as one who is in the dark. When you were newly saved, there were still temptations that you will fall for, sins that you will commit. But now you've been saved for 21 years and you're still susceptible to those things. That is because you're still too close to the wickedness. And so it's easy for it to sit back into your life. Put a gap between you and Lord. Because God has a call on your life and he has so much for you. And he doesn't want you to be caught in the wind of destruction when it comes. He doesn't want you to fall for false peace that Satan is handing out. So many people think that they're at peace because they have a good job and they can pay all their bills and their careers are going great. Everybody bows to them at work. But the reality of it is they are succeeding in an area where God has not even called them to. May God help us not to succeed in an area that does not count before heaven. Because true peace is only found when you are in Christ and when you are found in the way of life. When you are found fulfilling the call of God upon your life. When you are found giving and being a blessing rather than just accumulating blessings by receiving. 
Many people wake up and all their ambition is to get more and more. And they get all they can. And they can all they get. And they sit on the can. And they think that can has become their throne. The Bible says that what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Our daily drive should be to seek what more can I gain. But many people are living in that false peace. The only way to live and be in true peace and be in Christ Jesus is to learn how to put a gap between you and the child that you are. And the secret to being able to do that is to listen to what Paul said, which the Holy Spirit reminded me of, that you, when you were a child, you spoke as a child, you thought as a child, and you understood as a child, and then reverse engineer that for your favor. For your own personal development. Like I told you two things. I was going to tell you about prayer and meditation. Meditation consists of you sitting quietly before the Lord. And retiring your own thoughts. Bringing to captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. When you meditate and you remember those things that you have said about yourself. That makes you think that you are better than somebody else. Don't repeat them in the presence of your heavenly father. Just bring them as a thought. There are certain things that you don't repeat where it matters. You only bring them, the Bible says, the weapons of our warfare. They're not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds and casting down every imagination. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. There are certain thoughts that you don't go to God and say, God, you know that I don't like it when people do that. God does not want you to hear that. The Bible says God resists the proud. Don't come and boast like this before the Lord. Think it and just and know in your mind that you're thinking that you said that. And just retire that. And then once you're done with silence... Then you pick up prayer. And prayer is when you begin to speak words that condition your thinking. Paul says, when I was a child, what was the first thing he said he was doing? Put that scripture on the, on the screen for us. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. He said, my speech has got something to do with my thoughts. Many of us, we know that the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We think we say that which we have thought about, which is true, but do you know how you can change what you think about by changing what you speak about? I demonstrated here to you the other day. I asked someone to come up here and ask them to count in their mind without counting out loud one to ten, and then I asked them a question that required for them to speak. And the moment they spoke, they forgot what number they were. Because you cannot continue to think that which is different from what you speak. Look at what it says. It says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. And I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. You see, the words that I speak ultimately affects the thoughts that I have. Because when I speak... Even I begin to receive understanding. Because there are certain things, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and then we're going to really break bread and close. You know, when it comes to submitting oneself to the word of God, so that it can do us good, you need to learn how to speak that word of God. Like I said earlier on, you receive a letter that makes you tremble, makes you nervous, makes you anxious, makes you afraid. If you do not speak the word of God, if there's every possibility that based on your understanding of how things work, you're in trouble and you, ad you admit that you're in trouble. So what do you do? You begin to think fearful thoughts of the worst that can happen. But imagine if you receive that letter in the mail, that letter that says that you are in debt, that letter that makes you feel discomforted, and that letter that makes you feel discontented. Just like the man in the cave of Adullam, you receive that letter, and you look at it and say, wow, even though this is what this letter says, the word of God says, I am above always and not beneath. The moment you begin to speak that word, you begin to receive an understanding of what is really going on. And the understanding that you will receive is that this is what Jesus promised me that was going to be delivered. Thank you, Jesus, because this is tribulation right here. 
that is being delivered. So this is part of what you have arranged to make me strong. Now I give it back to you because you said to cast all my cares upon you. Your thinking changes the moment your speech changes. Submit yourself to God as their children and they will lift you up. Not only did I receive instruction from the Holy Spirit, I also asked for power to make the difference. So tonight we're going to break bread and we're going to do it a little differently. I really didn't want to preach for three hours, but all of what I wanted to say would have been three hours. So I will give you a quick summary and then when you listen to it again, you can piece it together in your own way. But for now, remember that we started with what the word of God is. It's the stronger version of your existence. You have a new creation in Christ Jesus, in the word. So you need that word to be engrafted over your natural being. And in order for you to do that, you need to take the posture of meekness, which means you're willing to let go of whatever it is so that you can receive all of him. You are not holding on to your pride. You're not holding on to any material thing, but you are willing to be meek before the Lord to say, not my will, but yours be done. And when I was talking about giving you an incentive, we read from John chapter 16, verse 33, that talks about the fact that it is a guarantee for us to be troubled in this world, not as a disadvantage to us, but as part of heaven's scheme for getting us ready for the master's use. And so what do you do? In order for you to maintain peace in the midst of the tribulations and trials, you need to be in Christ Jesus. And to be in him means that he also has to be in you, which means you have to receive that word of God with meekness by learning how to humble yourself, reducing that posture of pride and self-confidence by the process of meditation to nothing before the Lord so that you can speak with a humble tongue. And then when you begin to speak, your tongue will recondition your thoughts because you will receive an understanding that comes by the word of God. The Bible says that the entrance of God's word brings light and it brings understanding unto the simple. I want to speak to anyone here who may have struggled with lust or who may still be struggling with lust or maybe someone that is watching us. The reason why most people fall when lost and the temptations therein comes is because they believe they can resist. They believe in their own ability to not fall. They tell themselves, oh, I'm just going to look a little. I know myself. I'm not going to look all the way. Just a little. You see, that self-confidence is guaranteed to fail. But if you would humble yourself under the mighty end of God and say, Lord, on my own, I have fallen short of your glory but I choose to rely on the leading of your Holy Spirit because your word says, for as many as are led by your Holy Spirit, they are your sons. The moment you begin to speak the word of God about the leading of the Holy Spirit as, as different from your own ability to resist, guess what happens? You begin to receive an understanding of a man who needs help, who already has help. And that thought is what would allow you to be able to walk away as the Holy Spirit leads. Many of us struggle with things that Jesus already overcame. Many of us struggle with things that we should have even been walking in victory over simply because we're still trying to do it in our own abilities. And so as we break bread today, what I want you to do is I want you to speak with your mouth and say that I have been crucified with Christ. I want you to say it and I want you to think and visualize yourself being buried with him. For the apostle said, I was buried with him and when he was raised, I was raised together with him. So that when you think about the tribulations, the trials, the challenges, and the things that you have struggled to overcome, you will no longer see yourself struggling, but you will see Jesus riding into victory on your behalf. Today, I want you to use that same power that has been used against you. The power of your own imagination. See your old self separated from this new creation that you are. And say to yourself before the Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus says, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me.
He says, this bread is my body. This wine is my blood. And the way that he laid down his life and allowed his body to be torn was by him being meek and lowly before the, before the heavenly father. When he says, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus knew that it was possible to find a way, but he decided to resign himself to the way of the Father. I want to encourage you today that as you put that bread in your mouth and wash it down with that juice that you are saying to yourself from here onwards, I will do what the word says. I will believe what the word says. I will not challenge the word, the word of God with my position, with my tradition, with my condition. But I would allow every one of those things to be brought to subjection to the word of God. I will humble myself under the mighty hand of God. I will not have a boastful posture before the Lord. I will not pride myself as one who can do it, even though I may have done it before. But I would say I am the one that the Lord has chosen to do great and mighty things through. So Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And I want to read to us as we meditate upon these words. If you want to continue to pray, you can go ahead and continue to pray. I'm going to read to us from the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17. And it's going to be our scripture for receiving the communion today. Eating of the Lord's body and drinking of his blood in remembrance of him. If you want to keep praying and keep pressing into these thoughts, I encourage you to go ahead and do it. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 17, I said to the Lord, I said, we need power to be able to do this thing. We need power to be able to submit to you and let your word have its full preeminence. It says in verse 17, learn to do good. Seek justice. Learn to do good. Today, I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that the word that has come forth, albeit prophetically, you will also receive prophetically. You will receive as a word of prophecy pointing to the destination that you need to be, stirring up hope within you that you can be that person that does good works. That you can be that person whose light shines before men. Whose good works bring glory to the heavenly father. Because there is a requirement of you and I that we need to learn how to do good. We need to learn how to do good. And today we have learned once again under the unction of the Holy Spirit that for us to do good we have to think good. And for us to think good, we have to understand good. And to understand good, we have to speak good. And we can only speak good after we have silenced the filth and the wickedness. After we have allowed the bony structure of pride and human ego to be weakened before the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we stand before here, you today in one accord and in humility. Asking for there to be in each and every one of us a new commitment to your word. A new commitment to receiving your implanted word with meekness. To recognize that where we're coming from in the natural and in the flesh may be in opposition to your word, but that we are willing to submit to what your word says. These four things in particular were brought to me and they stand out. I've used one of them as an example over and over again, but I'm going to say the other three together with the fourth. The word of God says, do not worry. Your natural abilities have to be brought to subjection. I know that some of us 
We don't even know what we're going to do with ourselves if we don't do what we have always done because the flesh has been an oppressor. But the Bible says, silence the oppressor. Isaiah 117, I didn't read the rest of it, but you can read it on your own. He says, learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Let us rebuke that oppressor within us. That is always telling us, oh, you have to, you have to worry because you're responsible for this, you're responsible for that. What are you going to do? It, it keeps oppressing you within you. Silence that voice. And do what the word of God says, which is not to worry. The other thing that the word of God says is love others as I have loved you. Don't love them based on what they merit. Don't love them because they have earned your love and care. Don't love them because they have been kind to you. They have been nice to you. They are well behaved. Love them because the word of God says to love them. Any voice within you that is not allowing you to receive the instructions of the word of God, silence them. And then the third thing is this, which was actually the first thing that came to me. And it is pray, not faint. The word of God says men ought always to pray and not to faint. Whenever you feel faint hearted, that is your flesh. That is the opposition. That is the oppressor. What do you do? You submit yourself to the word of God in meekness and say, yes, I feel tired. I am, I am really beat up right now. But you know what? I am not going to stay beat up. I will pray because I'm only beat up in my flesh. I am only beat up in my human person. But then I will pray because that's what the word of God says. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. And then the last thing and thing number four is this. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. Many of us are burning the midnight oil trying to figure it out. Many of us are hopping from conference to conference. Calling people you know that you shouldn't even take advice from. Because you're asking them to advise you, but this thing they're telling you, have they practiced it? Is it working for them? But you're just desperate for, for answers. And the Lord is saying, you have run the streets enough. I just need you to sit here and ask me. He says, ask and you shall receive. These four things have come because when the Lord gives us things in force like that, they usually represent direction. The Lord is giving us the direction to march forward into our new season without hitting a brick wall, without running into a wall. And the Lord is saying, you're going to get there. I just need you to quit worrying. You will get there. I just need you to love them as I love you. I just need you to stop being so faint-hearted. I just need you to pray. No matter how tired you are, you can say, Lord, help me. No matter how frustrated they are trying to make you be, say, Lord, you are my defense. No matter how downtrodden you are, say, Father, you are the glory and the lifter of my head. Because when you humble yourself, admit the situation, and then receive the help of God, you will always overcome. And lastly, I didn't ask you to figure it out all by yourself. I said to you, ask me and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of things, of kings to search it out. But how do they search it out? He says those great and mighty things that you do not know, you find them by asking me. And then I will tell you and you will know where to go. Ask of me. Very quickly, just within, for a total of about two minutes. As soon as we break bread, I want to pray for somebody today who is saying, so if you, haven't bro if you haven't taken the bread and the wine, go ahead and do that now in case you need to come forward as part of this prayer point. I'm going to go ahead and take mine too. Thank you, Jesus, for your body that was broken for me and your blood that was shed for me. I remember you today and that you were buried and that I was buried with you. I remember you today that you, was, that you were raised and I am raised with you. Unto life, unto wholeness, unto assurance of faith and confidence in God. 
In Jesus' name, amen. I want to pray for a couple of people real quick. I want us to see if we can get through it in about two minutes. So as soon as you identify with this prayer request, I want you to come forth real quick. Just come forth real quick, real quick, real quick, real quick. The Bible says to him who has, more shall be given. And the situation that you're in, you can't even figure out what you have. When God came to Moses, God said to Moses, what's in your hand? He says, a stick, lay it down. And you're like, God, I don't even think I know what I have. What is it that I need to lay down? What is it that is in my hand? What do I need to have to get what I need? I can't seem to figure it out. Remember the word of the Lord says, ask, you shall receive. The Lord will reveal it to you, show you those things that you do not know. But he has sent me here today to do one thing just as a gesture of your belief in mine. Just as an act of faith and a demonstration of confidence in God. The Lord says to me, once they come forth, lift up their hands and I will take it from here. And so if that is you and you're saying, Lord, I need something to shift, but I do not know what I have. I can't even see what I have. What I think I have, I don't have peace. I don't have confidence that it is what you're asking me to bring. But I am here anyway. Lord, let me see the ram that is caught in the thicket. Lord, let me see what I have. I am willing to lay it down. Just let me see it. I am willing to sacrifice it, but just let me see it. Lord, let me see it. Eyes will be open in here today. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I lift up your daughter's hand as you have commanded me. As I lift up your hand, just be rest assured that the Lord takes it from here. And he will not let you down in the mighty name of Jesus. Once I've raised your hand, I want you to go back to your seat and just be confident in God that he who saw you and saw the thoughts of your heart and came forth with this word has already finished and perfected all that concerns you. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. If you could turn that music up a little bit. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this hand is lifted up. Once I prayed for you, just go and let somebody else take your place. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in Jesus' name, this hand is lifted up. Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. As the Lord says, lift up the arms that are weak, this hand is lifted up. In the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. In the mighty name of Jesus, over to you, the Lord of all spirits. Over to you, our Heavenly Father. This hand is lifted up. In the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. In the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. In the mighty name of Jesus, this hand is lifted up. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. Lord, we adore you. Someone is telling you that, oh, wait until you see. It, it gets even more challenging. It gets harder. If someone told you that recently, that whatever it is that you were discussing with them or that they brought to you, they're like, oh, you haven't even seen anything else. It gets even worse. It gets harder. It gets more difficult. If someone told you that recently, I want you to raise your hand. I want to give you the privilege of going back in time and fixing it. They told you that, oh, it gets even harder. And you did not shut it down. You were just like, oh, really? What do you mean? How? See, even though you didn't sound like you totally agreed with them, but you did not rebuke the oppressor. So right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, by the authority that is in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the mercy of God that is ever faithful, I allow for you today in the name of Jesus to be released of that burden that was placed on you. For authority has been given unto me. Jesus said to me that I have given you the authority to forgive sins. Whoever you forgive is forgiven. And so that burden that was placed upon you, I release you of it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. 
that which they have spoken over you is not what will be your lot, but what you will experience is what the word of God says. The word of God says that you have received the burden that is light and the yoke that is easy. The word of God says that your path shines brighter and brighter until the perfect day. The word of God says that you have help because your heavenly father is your help and a very present help he is in time of need. So any worry or anxiety that crept in from the declaration of the ungodly is neutralized over you right now in the mighty name of Jesus. You will have peace, you will have confidence, and above all, you will have result with which to shut down the oppressor in the mighty name of Jesus. One more thing. While I was preaching today, somebody came to your mind. And you keep telling yourself, oh, I have forgiven them. But you haven't reached out to make peace. That same person that came to your mind, not anybody else. As your hand were raised up today, the Lord has taken you and increasing your understanding and you will know exactly how to broker the peace so that you can reap the fruit of your obedience. You obeyed the Lord when you forgave them in your heart, but you know that it's not yet finished, that you need to reach across the divide. This week, the Lord will give you a way to make it happen, and that burden will finally roll off back into the valley so that you can be free to move with the cloud. In the mighty name of Jesus. When that happens, you need to come and testify. I want you to come and find me and tell me. And I said lastly, but I want to say this to you today. Make time to pray. Okay? Make time to pray. And the easiest way to pray more is to pray more. And I'm going to explain what I mean. If you want to pray more, Pray more often. So you're saying, I'm already praying an hour every day. What else does this man want? Well, it's not me, but the Lord is asking you to come up higher. And so that one hour prayer that you do, you do it just in your room, pacing back and forth, which is great. But when you're driving, you're listening to Pandora. When you're working, you're just listening to the news. The Lord is saying, pray always with all manners of prayers. So to pray more is to pray more often. And I'm going to tell you the reason why the Lord is asking you to pray more. You see, I told you about the three elements, the earth, the sea, and the trees. And the Lord is letting me know that we need to be concerned about the boundaries between each one of these elements. If you were not here on Tuesday, I strongly recommend you listen to that word. Because that is where many people will get lost. When the, when the wind blows to the earth, it may not touch them. When it gets to the sea, it may not get to them. You see, but that transition between the sea, the so-called gray areas, when it seems like things are dying down, that is where the enemy wants to trap people. And this is the reason why the Lord is saying you need to pray because he wants to bring you into a new realm and level of discernment wherein you can see those arrows before they leave the bow. And the moment you see the arrow before it leaves the bow, then you will also see the power that has been given to you to neutralize what the enemy is firing. We're at war, my friends. And I am not here to tell you what everybody else is saying or what many people are saying because if you're a soldier, you're meant for war, not for pleasure. Pleasure will come by the time the wicked is removed from the earth. But for now... We fight with all vigilance. Jesus says, be sober, be vigilant. Watch and pray. Anybody ready to pray more here? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as many as have demonstrated the desire to obey that which you have commanded, I pray that you will make it easy for them. Your burden is light, your yoke is easy. It will be easy because they will receive help from the Holy Spirit. They will speak in new tongues. In the mighty name of Jesus, they will receive the grace. In fact, you are receiving right now the grace to remember scriptures. When you're in your car and you're driving, you don't need to open your phone. You will just remember scriptures and you'll begin to speak the word of God back to him. And you will speak the word of God to situations. You will speak to mountains and they will move. 
I speak to you, I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, that it will be easy for you because you will remember scriptures and you will speak with new tongues. Some of you will start to speak in new tongues as you drive. This week in the mighty name of Jesus. And lastly, and this time around is a real lastly, I'm going to say this and I'm going to get off. I was talking about transformation and translation. Many of us have been transformed, but we have resisted opening our eyes in the new place that we've been translated to. The Bible says, I wake unto righteousness and sin no more. The Lord has honored your obedience and dedication with growth and expansion, but you are not opening your eyes to see what is around you, what is available to you. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that as your hands have been lifted up and your eyes are open to see what you have, what is in your hand, you would also see what belongs to others that has been put in your care, that you may empower them also in the name of Jesus. I have a leading in my heart to pray for us this week. As we go into this week, certain things, in fact, not just certain things, three things have been arrayed against the Ecclesia in the season that we're in. And many people, excuse me, will experience that this week. So I pray for you, anyone that wants to stand up to pray along with me, I want to encourage you, stand up, kneel down, but whatever it is that you're doing, I want you to tap into this prayer. Three things have been released by the horde of hell against the ecclesia. Thing number one is discouragement. This week you will not be discouraged. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that when the wind of discouragement comes, you will do like David did. You will encourage yourself in the Lord. You will encourage yourself in the Lord. Wind number one, you will shut it down. You will not be discouraged. And you will not be confused. You have not received the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. This coming week, there will be no confusion confusing thoughts, it's going to be soundness and clarity. In the mighty name of Jesus, soundness and clarity. And then the last one is every door that you have left behind, every place where you have said goodbye, that is beckoning to you to turn around like Sodom was beckoning to the wife of Lot. It might be in the form of an old friend. It might be in the form of an old tape or an old book. It might be in the form of an old movie. It might even be some colleague at work. Any one of those things that want to draw you back onto perdition. This week, as they raise their heads, they will be shut down for your sake. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will not turn back onto perdition. You will not retrogress, neither will you return to your vomit. But this week, you will continue to look forward because your eyes are looking straight ahead. The Lord has commanded you to set your eyes on what is ahead, to look straight ahead, and to learn more, to do more good. In the mighty name of Jesus, everyone that I have prayed for today will testify because you will overcome. Not even a single one of those three. You're not going to score two over three or one over three, but you are scoring three over three in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you for these ones because you have promised to keep them. And I know that you will keep us, Lord, in your love, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is good. Let's be seated. Alan, Alan is going to come up to receive the offering. But like I did on Tuesday, I just want to say thank you to those people who continue to show generosity to the house, people who continue to give and bring to this house as they are led by God and as they are proposed in their hearts. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we do not faint. One more piece of announcement that I want to make. You see, I wasn't sure if I should tell you this, but I'm going to say it now anyway, because I know now I can say it. What I say anyway is because of time. I see eyes that you have never seen. 
I know that some of us have seen sci-fi movies wherein they show aliens who take human form. And then after a while, you see their serpent eyes behind the normal eyes. That ability that they have is nothing compared to the one that you have. And I'm, he was brought to me. I saw it. He was almost passing. I was like, hey, what is that? And they said to me, those are the eyes. There are things that you can only see with the eye of faith. There are things that you can only see with that one eye that needs to be full of light. And so this is my challenge to you today. Don't go in the mirror because you might not see it in the mirror. And some of you might, I don't know. But what I want you to go is I want you to go into the word of God this week. Beginning with, from tonight if you can or tomorrow. Create a block of time. And tell yourself, I will see what I am reading. I beg of you in the mighty name of Jesus, this is a precious gift. Let us not leave it on the table. Let us not leave it behind. Think about it as a party bag that you're being given. So when you get home, open it up and take advantage of it. I know what I am telling you, and I'm going to explain it as best as I can. Many of us, when we read scriptures, we don't see what we're reading. And that eye has been given to you that can travel through time. So pray when you're about to study the word of God and say, I will see what I am seeing. What you're reading, I will see it. Let me tell you the genesis of this vision because I know things don't happen accidentally. As I was speaking to you, I inquired of the Lord and the angel of the Lord, I said, why is this now? And they took me back to Tuesday when I stood here and I said, maybe Tuesday or Saturday, when I said, let us read with our eyes and believe by faith. Anybody remembers that scripture? I mean, that expression? When I said that, I knew something was going on. It was an answer to prayer because I said to myself, I want to fear the unction for myself. And that was the unction that was speaking. And that which was petitioned of the Lord in that statement is brought here today, that we're about to see the things that we read in the word of God. This is not the time to close your Bible for another one or two months. This is the time for you to open it. I guarantee you there will be people here that will testify of going into trances and being in vision and seeing people like Zacchaeus climb the tree. Some of you will see Lazarus come out of the tomb. Some of you will see Elijah being fed by the ravens. Many of us will see things that we have just read and we've tried to imagine. You will literally be taken to those places and you will see them. Not just so that you can be excited and fired up, but the reality of it is this. When you can use the one eye to see, your entire body will be full of light. And when your body is full of light, the rest is history. Your radiance will drive the flies from you. That radiance will drive, will let principalities know to stave off your territory. That radiance would allow for things that have been looking for you in righteousness to find you. The goodness and the mercy that have been following you will be closer to you because now they know where you are. You see, it is not just so that you can say, wow, I saw Jesus on the cross and I cried. No, it's not just for the emotions. It's for the power. The time is short and the Lord says to expect more meetings like this because we're in our season of equipping. We have fellowshiped. We will keep fellowshipping, but we are in the season of equipping. God bless you. Alan. Hallelujah. God is good. What a night tonight. Very deep. Sis, if you'll help us with the offering slide, we'll go ahead and press in and give in. Several ways to give. Communion.house slash give website. Cash app, dollar sign, Communion House for PayPal, at Communion House. We give God praise for this opportunity to partner with him and what he's doing here in this ministry and this coming together of believers. Amen. God is good.
We'll wait just a couple of more seconds, and we will go ahead and pray. If you need an envelope, our dear brother Kenyatta is here. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for this night that you have brought about, O oh God, where you have spoken to us and encouraged us, have granted unto us deliverance, the mind of Christ being fully functional in us, O oh God, for your mercy that endureth forever, O oh God, that mercy in which you delight in. Lord, we say that we don't take lightly this season of equipping. Lord, even the ones that you have set before us, Iron, sharpening iron, oh God, to do your bidding, oh God, here in the earth, doing the work of the ministry, the work of the gospel. We give you praise and honor your name for this time of giving. Lord, a time to give cheerfully, to exercise, oh God, with what you have granted unto us, blessing to this ministry, to this place of fertile ground, knowing that you bring increase, knowing that you bring multiplication, O oh God. Continue to move in our hearts concerning what that giving looks like for each and every one of us, O oh God, in our tithe, but even excelling, O oh, oh God, in our offering, even as we have been encouraged this season to give sacrificially. For, Lord, we know that this is good ground. We know that this ground, these trees bear fruit. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all say, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, everybody. I know our time is fast spent, but my wife just reminded me. Ade, can you come up? Ade leaves for the UK on Monday. He's going back to the UK on Monday, and I just want us to stretch forth our hands toward him and say a word of blessing over him. Come on, let's keep celebrating Ade. He's a little shy, so he needs that encouragement. No, you can stand up here. I don't mind. Yeah, okay. Come on, come on. Yeah. Even though you're nearly as tall as me standing there. Oh, yeah. So we're glad to have had you here. We thank God for the experiences you've had. We thank God for your baptism. It was great to witness that. Praise the Lord. And, um, you know, I just want you to just stretch forth your hand. Just say a word of blessing his way. You know, that he, has, he that has begun a good work in him is faithful and just to bring you to a perfect completion. That from here, you're not turning to look at any doors that have shut behind you. But from here, it is onward and forward in the mighty name of Jesus. You have been transformed in this place. Now you will be translated in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you because this man has had an exposure to your word on this trip. And he will not be a stranger to your word. But Lord, he will continue to seek fellowship and audience with your word going forward in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for Ade. We love and appreciate him, and we thank you, Father, for this opportunity that we have had to pour into him. And as you have now been poured into, you go and be a blessing to others where you go. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. All righty. That's it, everybody. We'll see you on Tuesday.